No, no, no. no. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, there is. Can I turn on your sound? No. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Beijing, can you hear us? Beijing, Luis, Tren, can you yes, hear we us? Yes, hear you. Luis, Luis okay, is not great. here. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, just before we start, I'll introduce you, Doron, who's come here. He's a postdoc in cognitive science. He's joining us for the rest of the week. Um, and now we'll hear from Jonathan. Um, Jonathan did very well in kindergarten. <laughs> uh, in second grade, he had the swimming class where he did uh, very well too. Uh, but uh, no, Jonathan is a wonderful scientist working on various things in uh, various topics in cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, psychology, combining uh, theory and data analysis. One thing that I really, really admire about Jonathan is that he goes about problems he finds interesting himself and thinks very deeply about them. And just to tell you, I he he had an advisor who's a fairly um, ruthless person. <laughs> and uh, I remember that once I first met him, he was graduate student and his advisor told me, you know, this is a special student. So I thought, okay, indeed special. So <laughs> thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, wonder what can be done to what parts of the presentation will be. Unfortunately, I don't think there is okay. Solution. Okay, we will. Yeah, do you want yeah. to get rid of this also? We can just move it down, I guess. Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I would like to start uh, with an inspirational quote that I found at the hotel website. <laughs> the hotel website. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what to say about it, except that. Uh, in order to avoid your sleeping here and uh, in Beijing, uh, I would like to encourage you to ask questions. And um, much of what I will uh, say today is related to something that uh, we learned yesterday, uh, which is that this is a deterministic and the Markovian policy for an MDP. This is the this is a true statement, um, and I will I will relate to it uh, later later in my talk. Um, so the title of the talk is uh, intertemporal conflicts. So what do I mean by uh, conflict? Let's start with well, the entire talk will be based on examples. So it will be nothing formal, but these examples I think are uh, representative of. Uh, 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 of a class of problems which I think is most interesting and uh, relevant to the cognitive sciences. So let's start with a, a choice that is there's no conflict here. Uh, what do you prefer? Seven coins, gold coins, or four gold coins? Well, I guess seven is preferable, so that's an easy option. Do you want to get the money today, immediately, right now, or uh, during my after my second talk? I guess all of you would prefer to get the money right away. Um, so it's not it's an easy problem. Now, the reason uh, that you prefer that people, also animals, prefer to be rewarded now. And not later is related to something that is called the temporal discounting function. And the idea is that we model the value of 
sum of x that we will get the time as a product of uh, two functions. One is the value of x times a function which is a, a decreasing function. And this function is called uh, the temporal discounting function. And we, we uh, this function was, was uh, uh, mentioned uh, yesterday, yesterday in Aya's uh, uh, talk. Um, now, the reason that you prefer uh, to look at this temporal discounting function where people were asked, how much, man, how much does a sum of money, let's go back to the previous, yeah, it's easier to see. Uh, uh, how much does a dollar that you bet 30 months in the future, 60, 90, 120, and so on, uh, uh, how much are they worth to you now? Uh, um, so this is a, a decreasing function. Now the amount of the, the value of the gold coin that you will receive now is higher than the value of the gold coin that you're receiving today because this function d of theta is smaller than d of theta. So that's the idea of the temporal discounting function. Okay, so these were easy problems. What do I mean by a conflict? So to 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 uh, uh, demonstrate the conflict, I will. We'll discuss a problem that I'm sure uh, all of you have uh, encountered one way or another in which uh, there is a default alternative that is associated with some steady stream of either pleasure or pain uh, and an action that stops this stream. So, uh, for example, let's say that you need to write a review. Paper was sent to you. This is... Uh, so every day that you don't do it, you feel bad about it. It's a steady stream of uh, pain. You can do it and it will go away, but it's even more painful at the moment you actually need to write a review. That's an example. Uh, another example would be, let's say that you are in a, uh, in a kind of a relationship and you are unsure whether, I mean, this could be with your spouse or with your, a boss or with your PhD advisor and you're unhappy, you can endure another day and decide tomorrow whether you want to, to quit. We think it's painful, even more painful, but if you stay, there will be a steady stream of, of pain. Uh, <laughs> and there are other examples. Okay. So should I stay or should I go? <laughs> <laughs> so to be formal about it, I'm going to, to consider a concrete example. Um, no, I come from the Middle East. It's hot in the Middle East. It's also hot in, in Basel, but it's, uh, we always complain about the heat in the Middle East. So you can think about the, the following situation. You're in the middle of the summer, it's hot, and uh, your air conditioner broke down. You can do one of two things. You can order a technician that will fix it, choose action one, and this would be associated with R1. That's the pain associated with dealing with a technician and waiting and you know, arguing with, uh, with him or her. Or you can do nothing and wait for tomorrow. It is painful, less so because you know it's hot, Tomorrow you will make this decision. Um, now, what's your goal? Your goal is to maximize the, uh, all the rewards that you will receive from now to eternity with some discount function. Here R is negative because I'm talking about pain, but still, you want to maximize you when R is a, a negative number. And uh, to be concrete about it, I will put numbers. So let's say that the pain associated with a technician with fixing their conditioner minus two, and the pain associated with the heat is minus one. And to make things simple, I will consider a very particular temporal discounting. It was chosen for mathematical simplicity. So I give a weight of one for, uh, for the current time, uh, a third for uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the day after, and then I don't care. Anymore. So that's my temporal discounting function. So given this temporal discounting function, let's see what 
policy would maximize you. That's a simple problem. All the numbers involved are minus one, minus two, one, third, and zero. So we should be able to do uh, the math. So let's do it. Questions? Okay. Okay, so let's consider the simplest possibility. I will fix it today and get it done with. So I suffer minus two today. Uh, uh, the weight of today is one. So the total U associated the action of currently uh, uh, fixing it will be minus two. Another possibility to say, okay, I'm not going to fix it. I'm never going to fix it. So let's see what would be the consequences of never fixing it. So I will suffer minus one every day now to eternity, but I care only about <laughs> the first uh, four days. So this is now, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, day after after tomorrow, and so on. So I add all these numbers, multiply it by minus one, uh, and I get that uh, the total uh, uh, pain associated with uh, never fixing it is mi minus two to the third. So it seems that the optimal policy in this case would be uh, to fix the air conditioner now. Let's see. However, there is a problem here. And the problem is that while While you're taking the phone and calling the, the technician, I have this thought that maybe, maybe I should postpone to tomorrow. Why should I do that? Well, I will suffer today minus one. I will suffer today minus tomorrow minus two. The weight of today is one. The weight of tomorrow is one third. I'm doing the math. This is what minus one and two thirds, which is a larger number than minus two. So clearly, I should fix it tomorrow. Okay, so let's fix it tomorrow. This seems to be like uh, the optimal uh, thing to do. The problem is, is the problem is the following. So tomorrow, I will be faced with exactly the same dilemma. Okay, so I decide to fix it tomorrow, but tomorrow I will not fix it. I will wait for the day after tomorrow. Uh, well, if I'm never going to fix it, then why not fix it today? Well, if I'm going, if I'm going to fix it today, why not fix it tomorrow? <laughs> okay, so what should I do? That's what I mean by, by conflict. this is the conflict that I have with, um, with myself. Um, okay, so the, the, the topics that I will cover in uh, my talk are uh, two types of conflicts. One is a conflict with the future, uh, and I will present several examples associated with it. Another would be a conflict with the past, and uh, I'll relate it to uh, ferments. And if I have time, in the unlikely event that I have time, I'll always have this third option, uh, which I will say a few words about stochastic behavior and its neural correlate in, in grads, but we will see. Questions? Yeah. Um, so you picked a very particular discount. Right. Presumably, this would not happen with exponential. Right. Would it happen with hyperbolic? Yeah. I will talk about different. I will talk about different uh, discounting functions and how the shape of the discounting function affects uh, these conflicts. So these are sort of fundamentally no longer NDPs because right. of the shapes. Right. Well, also another question is here: you didn't need the possibility of the person to read. To know that they will reevaluate. If I could, I could ask if I am tomorrow, and I am to decide tomorrow. Then what would I decide if I were already tomorrow? I didn't, I didn't understand your question. So, so here you say, okay, I, I, I can say today that doing it tomorrow would be better, but you didn't consider the possibility that today I would think, what would I think tomorrow if I decide? Tomorrow? Well, that's what I did. I said, if, if I 
Uh, if tomorrow I'm going to fix it, then no point fixing it today. Tomorrow I'm not going to fix it, then I should fix it today. But why should I not fix it tomorrow if I fix it today? This is this is why we have a. This is like this is why this is a paradoxical example. But I will I will discuss ways to. I mean I'll, I'll discuss a way of addressing this paradoxical uh, cycle, vicious cycle. Yes. So, uh, so probably this is not part of it, um, but how about the comparative, the relative value? So, for example, we can fix it today, and we're fixing it, it's only a different result in this some way on third. So, so, when you're making a decision, you might like that's a small, or you might, and so your decision may be so random even that the relative differential are, are small. So, so, what would happen if we uh, minus? 10 and minus 20, yeah, yeah. or if it would be minus 10 and minus uh, right. 75. Right, so my question is whether the intertemporal contour would be affected. I will, I will, I will generalize, I will generalize. Okay. More questions? Okay. Um, so the problem here, um, so the question that I'm asking is what is optimal? I'm not, this is not a, uh, I'm, I'm, I will not show data on, on how people fix air conditioners. Um, the question here is a normative question, and the question is what's optimal? And uh, uh, what it turns out that it's not clear how to define optimal policy. It seems to be optimal at one point in time is no longer uh, optimal uh, later. So I'm going to argue that the necessary condition for a policy to be considered as a, an optimal policy is that it will be followed. So what we will look for are uh, uh, policies that will be followed. Um, more precisely, we will, we will seek self-consistent uh, 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 policies in, in the sense that given these policies, there's no incentive uh, uh, deviate. And the way to address it would uh, would uh, uh, be based on a uh, game theory. That's why I asked you to read uh, a few pages about uh, a game theory. So the idea is that we can we can think about actions that are made at a point in time as if they are made by different players, by different self, because each self has its own uh, uh, incentive, has its own uh, uh, has its own goal. So we can define this problem as a game in which decisions made at different points in time are as if they are made by uh, different players. And we will look for a self-consistent uh, solution to this game and the tool in game theory to find these self-consistent uh, uh, solutions is, or oh, oh, the, the uh, uh, theoretical construct is the most um, And the idea in the Nash equilibrium is the Nash equilibrium is a set of uh, policies, one for each player, such that no player has an incentive to deviate from it. So in that sense, the solution that we are seeking is a Nash equilibrium of the game that is played by all these players. This game has an infinite number of players, decisions that are made at different uh, points in time, but one can prove that nevertheless, this uh, game has uh, a Nash equilibrium in which uh, 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 all players have uh, the same, same policy. And we will look for this policy. Uh, so I think I said that we're, we're, we define the game. And the idea is that each player in the game simultaneously chooses an action. So player at one point in time doesn't know what other players choose in the sense that the player at point in time does not know what the future players uh, will do. And uh, um, the, the payoff function of each player depends on the rewards from his or from his point of view find zero into the future with his temporal discounting function. And 
that sense, this is the, the formal way of uh, uh, turning this problem into, uh, into a game. And we look for the time invariant Nash equilibrium, time invariant in the sense that uh, all players uh, share the same, uh, the same policy. Okay, so how, how are we going to compute uh, the Nash equilibrium uh, here? Um, so we will, we will look for, uh, so we've already seen that the pure strategy, not a Nash equilibrium, because if the strategy is to fix, then my incentive is not to fix. If the strategy is not to fix, then my incentive, my, my optimal policy is to fix. So this game doesn't have a pure Nash equilibrium, but it turns out that it does have a mixed Nash equilibrium, Nash equilibrium in which choices are made by a, a tossing a coin with a particular probability P, and we will see how to find this. Questions? But again, I, it's, there's a question. Yeah, so in this, you're assuming that the payoff structure for all the cells would be known, right? Because of the discount factor being known. But that does not seem realistic. So you mean that you don't know how much you will suffer? Yeah. Well, if you don't know uh, how much you will suffer, you don't expect to be able, you can, you can think about having a probability distribution over the possible sufferings, and then you can do the same trick. But the idea, I mean, uh, uh, again, this is not a practical, um, this is not a practical course in on, uh, air conditioning, yes or no. It's more like a conceptual, trying to, to convey a conceptual point with this caricature example. There was another question, yeah. What is a pure Nash equilibrium? So a pure Nash equilibrium is to choose with certainty, one of the quantifications. So in this case, would we have it to fix or not to fix? Just one more question. It's like, when you, so you have to choose one behavior, which is the optimal one among all possible behaviors. The type of behavior you allowed before was the behavior where now I decide what I would, I'm going to do and I expect I won't change, right? Uh, what if you allow many more behaviors where you're allowed to change your mind at any time and you're allowed to plan when you will change your mind? Well, for example, you could you could call the technician and tell him to come tomorrow and then leave the key and leave the house, drive to the other side of the country, and then he will come and will fix it. You force a decision on your future step. But this is not part of is this what you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, but the question is what is the set of possible behaviors that you so, allow? So in this in this caricature example, you only control your current behavior. Your control is over your current behavior. You decide now what to do. You cannot. I mean, how many times? Well, I'm not talking about you, but people in general decide to do something tomorrow and eventually don't do it. But, of course, do everything. No, no, I'm but, a hypothetical no, but, example. But, but the question, if you know that that will happen, then why not consider this as one of your possible behaviors among which you have to So that's, in, in a sense, that's what we do here. We, you, you take into, when, when you compute, the, 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 you're looking for a policy such that it will be followed, given the fact that your future self has different interests from you. From, from your current interest. Okay, uh, last, last way of asking. Okay. Question. Can you define the set of policies that you allow among which we will choose the best one? So the set of uh, uh, policies is uh, you choose uh, with the probability whether to fix or not to fix now. And that's all you allow? Yeah. But you're allowed not to follow it. You're allowed not to follow it. Yeah. But isn't that a problem? Well, but that's you only. We're looking for that, that's the point. That's I mean, the whole point is that you're looking for a policy such that you will not have an incentive not to follow it. I know that's what's a weaker. To it's do. a weaker. Con exactly. It's a weaker condition, but that's exactly. the best you can do. That's the best you. Can do. That's you find the policy such that 
you will not be you will not have an incentive to defaze. But you understand what bottle means you are allowing a smooth policy. What other policies are you can you allow? That you know that you will change your mind. Well, you know here that you that you cannot control it. Something that you know, but you cannot control. But you can plan that you will change your mind. That's exactly what you do. I mean, if you if you uh, if you would not have taken it into consideration, you would have said, okay, I will fix it tomorrow. And, and that's it. But this will not take into account the fact that tomorrow you will not fix. <clears throat> yes. So this is a repeated problem, right? So each day I again and again think about the same problem. I think about it the same way. So you assume no learning from day to day. Learning will only make it more, more difficult. I'm looking for a policy. Let's say that I know everything that there is to know about the problem. I'm just looking for the optimal policy. In this problem where you know everything that there is to know about it. So no, no, no point, there's no learning. No learning can be associated with it because you know you already know everything. Sure. But maybe on the first day, uh, you think about this way, but the second day you say kind of can accumulate your pain in a way and say, okay, so yesterday I well, suffered all yesterday was sunk cost. You cannot undo the pain of yesterday. But you can learn. Okay. Let's assume that the payoff matrix is I'm assuming that you know everything there is to know. I mean that, that's like the simplest problem that one can think about. The numbers are one. Third, zero, um, minus one and minus two. And some combination of them should give you, and I'm looking for the optimal policy here, and some combination should give it. And I'm looking for this combination. And uh, the approach is to look for a policy that given this policy, it will be followed, or in more technical sense, this is a Nash equilibrium of the uh, game that all these players uh, play together. Yes. This is a player between multiple game between multiple players. Between decisions made at multiple times, I consider them as if they are multiple players. Yeah, yeah, players. So suppose if I fix now, so myself now get uh, I'll get minus two. So what what will be the cost for the myself tomorrow? So so if 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 the air conditioner if you fix the air conditioner today, then tomorrow I mean there's no there's no, it doesn't matter what future cells tomorrow will choose because there will be no suffering because everything will work. Their reward will be just zero. I'm sorry? Their cost will be just zero. Yeah, there will be no pain for them. Okay, so how, how are we going to find this, uh, uh, this uh, probability? Well, let's talk about the possibility of not doing anything. What would be uh, uh, given this policy P? Let's say I'm assuming that every all players are, are choosing with a probability p. What would be the value? And I'm using here the, the, the RL notation of the value of an action a zero, not doing anything, assuming that the policy is to choose with the probability p. So there will be the um, the pain of today of, uh, with the discounting of today uh, plus uh, the pain of tomorrow. Um, the pain of tomorrow with uh, the, the discounting of tomorrow, but the, the pain of tomorrow has two components. One is if I fix it, it will happen with the probability P. And if I don't fix it, and this will happen with the probability one minus P. And I need to add to it, and you don't see it under this line, there is D2. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's uh, what will happen two days from now with the probability that I will fix it two days from now, which is P times one minus P and times R1, that's a pain associated with, with fixing it uh, two days from now with the probability that indeed I will do it, times uh, one minus P square, the probability that I will not fix it so that, the next two days times R0. So the, the equation, because otherwise- I don't know how to- well, uh, Just zoom out, uh, oh. uh, escape something more or something like that. Can you press it? I think it's just you. It's because the chat is on red. So I think if you just open the chat, the bar on the bottom will go. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, we just do a different mode. Uh, no, maybe like that. Oh. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, 
uh, 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 for, for two days into the future, probability that it will be fixed in two days, the probability that it will not be fixed in two days, and then I have the D3, D4, and D5, and so on. So that's some function of P. And uh, I can talk about what would be the value of fixing it. So that would be the pain associated with fixing it times the discounting of today, which is, which is one. And that's it, because there's no, no more pain in the future. And to find this uh, P, what I need to do is to equate these two uh, uh, um, to these uh, Q functions, uh, find the P such that Q of A0 is equal to Q of A1. And if you do the math, you find uh, uh, the, the particular P that does it with uh, the test number. Yes. So is there also like an asymmetric equilibrium where like my future selves commit to not fixing it? And then me today, knowing my future self will not fix it ever, now I decide I have to fix it today. So this would be a, a non-time invariant Nash equilibrium. And there are many such uh, equilibria, and I'm looking, but I'm looking for a symmetric one, given the fact that the problem is symmetric. Yeah. So every day is the same like every other day. So no reason to break the symmetry. So I'm looking for, for a, a symmetric solution. Turns out that there is always a symmetric solution. I have a little bit of question. Why doesn't so why you don't allow P to change? That's 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 uh, that's exactly this question that, that, that just that was just asked, which is uh, um, can I you can allow P to change like imagine that the future P will change and you imagine that again the next day. This could still be the same problem you would face today and tomorrow, just you but it's related, I agree. So when when so if I have a different p, then my incentive would be to choose deterministically. For any other p, my incentive, I, I, optimal policy for me now would be to be deterministic, to choose one either fix or not fix deterministically. If if I believe that the future selves don't behave according to this p, it should be deterministic. But in your previous equation, you could not have P1, P2, P3. If, if I solve for all possible P's, I can find many, many solutions which are uh, uh, also Nash equilibrium, but not time invariant Nash equilibrium. Okay, so one thing to note about this, uh, this uh, policy is that it's, it's suboptimal. What do we mean by a, a Pareto suboptimal? Now, with this policy, I don't care what would be the outcome of my coin. I could fix, I could not fix. In any case, my pain would be equal to R1. So why not fix it and you know give a better life to my future selves? Sure, but this is not a, a this is not a, 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 an equilibrium point of this problem because if I if I believe that I should do it, then there's no incentive to do it. I should wait for tomorrow. Uh, all sets will be better off. Uh, there are too many off, off here. If the A1 is chosen, um, but uh, uh, this is not uh, an equilibrium uh, point of this problem. Now we know this, this uh, 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 being Pareto suboptimal, this is something that we know from game theory, prisoner's dilemma, and uh, we also obtain it here. <coughs> um, so thinking about uh, going back to, to cognition, one can think about this as a, as a normative theory for stochastic procrastination. So we sh it's better for everyone that we will do things on time. We don't, we procrastinate. But we don't procrastinate forever, at least most of us. At some point we do it. So you can think about this framework as a framework that explains a, a stochastic a procrastination. Now, technical question. Should I do something with the chat? Uh, I don't know if there are, so, so anyone is responsible for There's no question. No question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this was a very unbiological uh, uh, Discounting function, and also know that and this is one study that measured different discounting functions in different individuals. 
we know that uh, uh, the variability in discounting function, so one may want to know what happens if we choose another uh, discounting function. So I chose this one. Why? Because it's easy to, to do the math. So let's consider this one. So uh, to clarify, the value d of zero is one, as always. I care about tomorrow, and I give it uh, uh, 75, and I don't care after tomorrow or any other day. Okay, that's a different discounting function. Let's see if anything interesting comes out of this problem. Okay, same, same pain. I can fix it today, suffer minus two. Um, I can uh, never fix it. And then uh, the pain associated with it minus one time and three quarters. Now, if you know math, then yeah, this seems like a better option. So, okay, whatever, I will leave with it. But there is a problem here. Well, let's, let's consider the possibility of fixing it tomorrow. So fixing it tomorrow implies that I will suffer minus one today and tomorrow I will suffer minus two. And because I care much about tomorrow, the total would be even worse than fixing it today. So best thing to do is never to fix it. But if for some reason I fear that uh, I will fix it tomorrow, then I should just as well fix it today. It would be better off fixing it today. Uh, if I don't fear that I will fix it tomorrow, then fine, I, I shouldn't fix it today. So, so the question of uh, uh, what I should do depends on, on my belief about tomorrow, and this is the same thing that will happen tomorrow. What I, what I will do tomorrow will depend on what I think that I will do uh, um, uh, the day after tomorrow, and uh, uh, so on. And if we, if we look for self-consistent uh, policies in, in this example, uh, what we find is that there are two policies that I will call them uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy behaviors. So one, Nash equilibrium here is to pa patient, patiently endure the pain. That's one possibility. And another one that can be thought about is, as, as a, perhaps a compulsive is to fix it today because I fear that I will fix it tomorrow. So we can think maybe it's like kind of a compulsive behavior. So these are two equilibria, Nash equilibria, two, uh, two Nash equilibria, uh, this uh, uh, multiple serves game. There's another uh, Nash equilibrium here, which is mixed to, to, uh, to fix it with uh, some probability, but I will not go into it, but if we think about any uh, dynamic uh, learning or calculate calculation of this fixed point, it turns out that this fixed point is in, in some sense dynamically unstable, so I think we can, we can put it aside. So in this example, we had uh, uh, two behaviors, one uh, like the healthy one, which would be to patiently endure the pain, and the other one is a compulsive behavior, which is um, uh, self-consistent, but seems uh, no, no, optimal. So we suffered enough. Let's talk about positive things. Okay. So consider the following problem. Um, you inherited a fine bottle of wine, I don't know, from the 19th century. Very expensive, very fancy, supposed to be very good. And uh, you can do one of two things. You can drink it supposed to be very, very good and enjoy it, or you can keep it. Now, keeping it has, has it will give you a stream of pleasure because every time a friend comes by, you say, ah, look, I have this fancy bottle of wine. Wouldn't it be nice to drink it one day? And say, oh, yeah. <laughs> so in that sense, it's, it will give you a constant stream of rewards. And again, to be a... a, a quantitative about it, let's, let's add numbers to the problem. So the reward associated with a, 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 a stream of rewards is one pleasure point 
per day from just showing off. And the pleasure of drinking it would be two points. And uh, again, we need to think about the, you see the numbers are rather similar to the numbers we had previously. We use the same temporal discounting function as before. And the goal is again uh, uh, to maximize this function. And uh, we already know the math, so we know how to, uh, how, how to uh, express it. So we can drink it today, and the pleasure associated with it would be plus two. We can never drink it. Pleasure associated with it would be high, would be higher. So in principle, we should uh, never drink it. But as before, there's always this fear that maybe tomorrow I will drink it. Now, if I fear that tomorrow I will drink it, and I just as well should drink it today. And again, the same, same issue. Um, okay, so we look for self-consistent uh, policies here, and again, we find uh, three self-consistent uh, policies. Uh, two, uh, uh, two can be thought of as self-fulfilling uh, uh, prophecies. So. If I'm patient, I can never drink it. If I'm in, impulsive, then I will drink it today, fearing that I will drink it tomorrow, so I should just as well do it today. And uh, the, the third one, uh, mixed traffic equilibrium, which again is in some sense dynamically unstable, so we will not discuss it. Questions? Yes. So uh, this would change the math, but it seems like this problem, like. The reward I get from holding up this model and showing it off to my friends will change over time, like that actual reward. And that, after I've done that a hundred times, you see what I mean? Like, um, I, would, I, would, I would get a different reward. Again, this is a caricature example that if you don't like it or you don't like wine, let's say that uh, you have uh, some money in the bank and you have interest. Every, every well, period of time, you get the same, you get some interest that you can use for, for buying stuff, or you can buy a luxurious vacation, take all that money out of the bank and buy a luxurious vacation. So that would be an equivalent example. Again, I'm not, not an expert in wine or in showing off, but I am <laughs> an expert in showing off, but not in, you get the point. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the, the point here, that's just a caricature example for this uh, very simple problem, and that I would, I would like to take it as an example of a larger class yeah. of problems. So I'm just wondering though, like, so do, does, do these game theory models, which I'm not an expert in at all, um, allow for, I know they allow for you discounting in time, but like allow for you to, in a sense, discount individual actions over time? Like depending on how many times you've seen. Action. So the, the way that we think about it is each action is taken independently by, by, by itself. Then we can complicate things. Very complicated. I want to simplify. Okay. Okay. Another example. Well, same discounting function as before, but this time. Uh, question? Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, I guess could one of the you know limitations cover maybe like one way to get around it be to sort of change the view into something like nonlinear, for example? Because right now you're sort of just assuming that you're just linearly summing up rewards um, scaled by like a discount factor each day. But uh, I'm wondering if you like uh, add as a nonlinearity to that. Uh, Nonlinearity were so there's you can have a nonlinearity here which will have absolutely no effect, and the idea that you I mean you, you can go against the idea of a temporal discounting function but then you need to to tell me to give me a different framework for how to what to how to consider a discounting temporal discounting I mean that's the standard way of implementing a temporal discounting. Okay. Yes. Um, I think that your appeals to a sort of time translation and variance principle for the Nash equilibrium story. Um, if one appeals to another time translation and variance principle when people the discount function, that would force exponential discounting. So the whole 
this is a different principle, I know. The whole paradox emerges because, uh, uh, because of the temporal discounting function that they chose. Yeah. Um, I just wanted if you could say a bit more to help me see why it's plausible to appeal to the one-time translation of variance principle for the Nash equilibrium story, but not appealing to another time translation of variance principle for discount. Well, because the, the temporal discounting function is what we measure. We measure that's we measure non-exponential uh, uh, discounting functions. Right. Thanks. Um, wine. Uh, should I answer? Yes, maybe you can read it out. Um, the first one was a comment, maybe a question. Oh, it's just a comment. Okay. Oh, I'll add it there. Um, how am I doing with time? Doing fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, no. So we, we can take a break whenever, sorry. <laughs> we can take, <laughs> you can take a break whenever you like. Okay, and so let me uh, uh, finish this example and then, then take a break. Okay, so same problem, uh, different temporal discounting function. Again, I can drink it today. I can never, I can decide uh, uh, never uh, to drink it. So uh, um, drinking today is better, but drinking tomorrow in this case is even, even better. So, I should postpone my drinking to tomorrow, but I may fear that tomorrow I will not drink, but tomorrow I will postpone it to the day after, and so on and so forth. You already know the drill. Um, and uh, so it turns out that uh, for this example, the only uh, self-consistent policy is a policy of drinking it with some, with some probability, following the same rule. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to summarize what we saw so far before taking the break. I'll break. Okay, so we had this uh, problem and we considered two temporal discounting functions. One is this one, one is this one. Clearly none of them is biological in any way. And uh, we considered uh, two types of problem. One is a broken air conditioner and one is a wine associated issue. There should be also wine here. And um, so but, but there were particular values that we used for R0 and uh, for uh, R1. Now I'm answering uh, your question. So, well, if one of them is substantially better than the other, if one of the values is substantially better than the other, then I mean, if the reward, the social the immediate reward is much larger than whatever related to the stream, then we should uh, uh, prefer uh, uh, taking the immediate reward. Similarly, if the stream is much better than the immediate uh, reward, we should take the stream. But this is the gray region denotes the, the, um, the, the, the range of values of this particular discounting function in which there is a conflict. And similarly here, the gray region here denotes the uh, range of values of R0 and R1, in which there is a conflict for this particular temporal discounting function. So when you can scale up things uh, and you will still get, you get uh, scale up, scale down uh, things and still get a uh, conflict. And the type of behavior that we saw, uh, this was for the negative rewards for this discounting function was stochastic procrastination. Uh, uh, for this one, it was the, this uh, compulsive behavior and self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, for the positive one, here we saw again self-fulfilling prophecy with impulsive behavior. And here there was just a stochastic choice. Um, so these were the four examples that we uh, considered here. And the question is, I mean, how general and now we can plot the third and the fourth temporal discounting function and, and, and see what happened. Now it turns out that um, these uh, examples cover everything. So what we, what we care about is a, a quantity that relates to uh, uh, the area under the uh, uh, temporal discounting function or the integral of the temporal discounting function and the first point in the discounting function. These are the things 
that uh, matter, and they divide the uh, uh, infinite world of possible temporal discounting functions into two groups. One which I will call hyperbolic-like temporal discounting function, which is a large group, initially large drop, and then a, a relatively more shallow decay, or one in which the drop happens, there's not the drop here happens later. And, and these two types of temporal discounting functions are, are uh, uh, divide uh, uh, the world. And the functional temporal discounting function is something that is uh, be, uh, between these two uh, possible discounting functions. And they determine, uh, they determine everything. Basically, what we care is one aspect of the shape of the discounting function. And the other one is the polarity of the reinforcers, whether they are positive or negative. And uh, um, with these two things, we, we, we characterize all possible paradoxes that we have in, uh, in this. Uh, and many of these behaviors are Pareto suboptimal in the sense that we could have done better. It's better not to, to procrastinate. Nevertheless, it's not a, a self-consistent policy for these uh, temporal discounting functions. Going back to the Bellman optimality equation. I mean, in the Bellman optimality equation, if you write the Bellman optimality equation, then uh, there exists an optimal policy which is uh, deterministic. But the, the key here is that in the Bellman optimality equation, one thing that is embedded is uh, an exponential discounting function. So all these paradoxes emerge in this problem because the temporal discounting was not exponential. Now we may not care about non-exponential temporal discounting functions, except for the fact that this is what is measured both in behavior of uh, humans and uh, animals. Uh, yeah, this is to highlight it's, it's the, the deviation from exponentialities. Uh, I think that this is a good time to take a break and I will resume in order to do it. Okay, so let's start in... Uh... I think it's more painful to put things off until tomorrow. Function D of T may be growing, so I wonder if there's any selection criteria for this function D. So uh, if we use an iterative expression D of T, always an expression. Or is that people don't iterate the thing? Well, the only, uh, uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, but the only function D that uh, will not that cannot give give rise to these paradoxes are exponential temporal discounting function. The reason that we are interested in non-exponential discounting function is that these are the functions that are measured experimentally, both in humans and uh, in animals. In my opinion, the D of T is our subjective weight, so we don't need definitely be relative. But there will be conflict between the two ideas. Will a finite rising uh, setting solve a paradox? Um, yeah, a finite rising setting will solve the paradox because ask. I mean, this uh, 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 um, you know what will happen. What's the optimal thing to do? You know what will be done the last day, so you know what will be done the day before. So on, so uh, conflict uh, has. Uh, uh, the the, the um, infinite component is, is essential for uh, uh, for the paradox, and, and, and clearly we are not infinite. Uh, we die at the end, and uh, we know it. But I'm not sure that we take it into account uh, when uh, considering whether to fix. Uh, I think I can. Yes. Do I, do I turn it off? Okay, so this, this was a conflict that we have with the future. Now we want to, to switch gears and talk about a different conflict, conflict that we have 
uh, uh, with the past and perhaps uh, um, a more uh, practical question, question that I ask myself almost uh, every day, and this is what should I wear, okay? You see that I'm well dressed, <laughs> and a lot of time thinking about this problem, and I'd like to discuss it with you, so that you will know how to uh, uh, to dress. So I have two options. <laughs> this is one option. This is the other option. I've never seen you in that. <laughs> I, I will discuss the pros and cons of these two options. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't have a shirt. So the, the reason to wear black is that uh, it makes me look thinner. So clearly, clearly I should wear black. But but you made the point, which is uh, uh, it should be clarified. So if I wear the same uh, shirt twice in a row, then Rava may think that I don't change my shirt, and this has consequences. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem is that I never remember what I wore yesterday. I'm absent minded. Um, okay, so I'm going to formulate it as a, a mark of decision process, and there are two states in this world uh, depending on what I did yesterday. So, yesterday, I can hardly, can, can hardly see the color, but yesterday I could have worn red or black, and today I can choose to wear black, or I can choose to wear uh, red. So this is a rather easy problem, and to make it more concrete, I'm going to put numbers into this problem. Okay, so if yesterday I wore black, today I wear black again, Rava says, stay away. He has not changed his shirt for a while, so no social reward for me. <laughs> Similarly, if yesterday I wore red and today I wear red again, no social reward for me. How is equal to zero? However, if uh, yesterday I wore red and today I come with a black shirt, and Rava says, "Oh, you look thin," and also I see that you change your shirt, <laughs> so we get three points of social reward. <laughs> but well, if I wore if I wear red and yesterday I wore a, a black, then it says, oh, you've changed your shirt. It's nice. So I get one point of social reward. Okay, that's a problem. And now you will help me decide what to do. The problem is I don't remember what I wore yesterday. We need to be uh, clear about my goal. So we have the same goal as before with this uh, temporal discounting function, and we want to maximize all the social rewards that I get from now to the end of time with temporal discounting. But for simplicity, I'm going to use like the simplest discounting function possible, which is I only care about today. I don't care about the future. The future is in the future. And this can be, I mean, this is a, 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 an example of an exponential discounting with, with infinite a, a discount rate. So I only care about today. So it is a problem. And I want, so the, the meaning is that I want to maximize the immediate reward. So let's see uh, how I'm going to solve this uh, problem. Okay, I don't know what I wore yesterday. Might have been red, might have been black, but uh, a black makes me look thinner. Look at me, the sign. <laughs> so clearly, clearly I should wear black, okay? But then this thought, that is creeping. Well, probably I, I've already made this decision yesterday. It's most likely that yesterday I wore black. So clearly I should not wear black today, I should wear red. Hmm. Maybe this is what I did yesterday because I was playing with the thought. And so probably yesterday I wore red, so I should, today I should wear black. But this implies that yesterday I wore black. So you kind of get the feeling that it's a problem that has a similar nature to the problem that I previously described, but this time it has nothing to do with the exponential discounting because with the deviation from exponential, from exponential discounting, um, because, well, we don't use exponential discounting. And if, I, if my policy is deterministic, then I will get nothing. So if I always wear black, 
always were red, then you know people will, will stay away from me. And you know, okay, that's so the deterministic policy is really bad in this case. Okay. So what about being stochastic? So um, this would be a deviation from what we learned uh, um, about Markov decision uh, problem and the fact that there exists uh, uh, an optimal deterministic uh, policy. So let's make a decision by tossing a coin. So what's what's the real goal here? Well, what I uh, what I want is to maximize the the, the, the alternations between red and black. So the coin that maximizes alternations is an unbiased coin. So clearly what I should do in this example is, well, best thing is to remember what I, what I, what I uh, wore yesterday, but this is a limitation that I cannot overcome. So the best thing would be to take a coin, toss it in the air and decide according to the outcome of the coin, whether to wear a uh, black or red, because in 50% in, in of the cases there will be Alternation people will talk to me. So here you assume that you cannot remember. I cannot remember. That's your assumption. That's your assumption. I'm absent minded. Um, okay, so I decided that I should uh, toss a coin. So I toss a coin in the air, and there's an outcome. And I should, well, I look at this outcome, and well, even before looking at it, I'm, I'm starting to think about it. And, and well, Optimal policy is to toss a coin, an unbiased coin. So probably yesterday I also tossed an unbiased coin. Now there were two possibilities. With 50% yesterday I wore black, and with 50% yesterday I wore red. If I wore yesterday black and today I will wear red, I'll get one point. If yesterday I wore uh, red and today I wear black, I will get three points. So the value of wearing black is three times higher than the value of uh, uh, wearing um, red. So basically what it tells me is that given that I'm tossing a coin, I should ignore the coin and wear black. They did. Well, again, if I don't toss a coin and wear black always, then I should wear, wear red. So it doesn't seem to work, this uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, tossing of the coin. Okay, but we already have the tools to address this problem. And what we will look for is a self-consistent policy. What do I mean by a self-consistent policy? A policy that given this policy, I have no incentive to deviate from it. So a coin, or a stochastic policy that given this policy, I have no, no incentive to deviate from. That would be the self-consistent policy. This would be the Nash equilibrium of this game that I play. Now, this is not a game that I'm playing with my future self. That's a game that I play my past self. All the times in the past, the war shirt. Okay, so let's look at the numbers here. So the value of wearing black is equal to three times the probability that the state is red. That is, it is the wall red. The value of, reading, of, of uh, wearing red is one point times the probability that the state is black. That is the probability that yesterday I wore black. So the self-consistent policy would be such that the value of wearing black is equal to the value of uh, wearing red. And since the probability that the state is red plus the probability that the state is black is one, that's an easy mathematical problem. It turns out that the policy that is self-consistent would be to toss a coin with a bias that is uh, three quarters. So I wear black three quarters of the time. That's why you never saw me in red, Rava. And uh, then uh, the probability that in the past the state was red is one quarter, and the reward associated with wearing black is three times the probability that I wore red, which is a, a, a quarter. And similarly, the uh, value of wearing red is one times the probability that the state is black, which is three quarters. 
So this is a self-consistent policy, and this is clearly uh, Pareto suboptima in the sense that I would have been better off tossing an unbiased coin, but this is not a self-consistent uh, policy. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so this is a stupid example. I mean, clearly you say at this point in time, I should have a diary or write a memo and tell it. It's so important to me that I'm spending time discussing a, a, a fashion question. Maybe I should write a memo telling me what it will, will indicate what I wore yesterday. The reason that this is this is a, this example is interesting is that this is a, a paradox that emerges in a large family of, of problems that are known as a partially observable Markov decision a problem. problem. These are a problem in which the state of the world is not exactly, the world is Markovian, but the state of the world is unknown to us and could depend on our uh, uh, past uh, policy. And in this, uh, uh, um, and one can show that one can always find a self-consistent uh, 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 solution to this uh, problem of, of active in, in the, fam the family of active policies. That is, I know I, I, I have an uh, uh, observation and I react to this observation. What, uh, this one can show that it's possible to find a, a Nash equilibrium or self-consistent solution to these problems. Um, but sometimes this uh, solution would be stochastic and not deterministic. And this is a, an interesting deviation from what we know from a, a fully observable Markov decision processes. So that's a problem that emerges or paradox that emerges from the partial observability of the state and not from the shape of the temporal discounting, but still the, the theoretical framework, the way to think about it, or a way to think about it using game theory is, uh, is the same. Uh, so going back to the Bellman optimality equation, but what is different here is that we cannot talk about a policy that depends on the state. We don't know the state. This is why the results are different from, from the one that we got in, uh, in the MDP with exponential discount. Um, so what's the relationship uh, between uh, the solution to, to the Bellman optimality equation and this uh, Nash equilibrium or self-consistent uh, self uh, policy. So it turns out that, that if we have uh, full information about the state of the world and uh, a, a temporal discounting function is exponential, then the solution to the Bellman optimality equation is also the time invariance uh, uh, Nash equilibrium or the time invariant self-consistent solution. So we can think about this a, a framework of looking for a time invariant self-consistent solution is a generalization of the solution to the Bellman optimality equation to those cases in which uh, uh, the world is only partially observable and uh, temporal discounting is Questions? Yes. So, uh, in a key, you can define the states as the beliefs. The state. The state you can write a um, fully observable mark of decision process over there, and the, the policy is deterministic. So, what So, uh, I'm looking for for a, a write it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking for reactive policies. So reactive policies would be policies in which you react to the observation. You can generalize it to having a finite state automaton, which, uh, um, which represents something about the state, but it has to be finite state. If it's not, if it's not finite state, then we go back to your to your Good, um, Yeah, so now I want to, to, to uh, uh, switch gears and talk about uh, um, behavior. So there's a long history uh, of uh, experiments uh, um, in animals, also humans, 
uh, in which uh, animals are trained to choose, to repeatedly choose between alternatives and is uh, rewarded according to, uh, to its choices. And I'd like to talk about a family of experiments, uh, work that was pioneered by um, Richard Herrnstein in the 1960s, in which um, I trained the pigeons to, to peck on one of two keys, and occasionally the pigeon received the reward. Uh, and and the, the, the function that relates pecking to, uh, uh, to reward was, was a non-trivial one, but for the sake of discussion, it has the following properties. First, it depended not on, only on the current uh, peck, but also on the history of the pecks. So the history affected um, the history affected uh, behavior, and it affected it, it in a way that uh, tries to to model something that is known as diminishing returns. So the idea is that the more the animal pecks on key one the more likely it will be rewarded by pecking key two. The more it pecks key two, the more likely it is to be rewarded from uh, by pecking uh, uh, the key one. But still, one can change the parameters such that everything else being equal, one of the keys will be. So what you see here are examples from the original experiments of uh, Richard Herrnstein. Uh, each point here is a different day, and the days and each uh, symbol denotes a different pigeon. And the day is different in the parameters that characterize this function. And uh, the data, what, what, what you see here, uh, uh, what Hernstein did was to uh, count the number of times uh, uh, key one was pecked, count the number of times that key two was pecked, which is N1. In, uh, but also measure the number of rewards that the animal obtained following a peck on key one and the number of rewards the animal obtained following a peck on uh, key two. And what he, what he presented was uh, the fraction of pecks as a, as a function of the fraction of income. So each point here is one day or one animal. And what he noted is that by changing the parameters of this function, the animal moved along this line. But uh, to a good approximation, animals were always aligned along this uh, diagonal, and uh, he termed this uh, behavior the matching. But sorry, so you, here the, the work doesn't only depend on time, depends also on what the animal does, right? It doesn't depend, it depends on the pecking, yeah. So there are versions in which depends on time, there are versions in which depends on uh, pecking themselves. Here, actually, uh, I think it depends on time, but the pecking rate is relatively constant, so it doesn't really matter. So the more you are on one side, the more likely you will be to be rewarded on the other side. And then it will just occasionally move from one side to the other. Right, so you cannot maximize. Well, you can maximize in the sense that there always, there, always there exists a a, a, a policy that is better than another policy. Right, but you would be changing. You would be changing. That, yeah. So if you constantly choose one, then it's in, in your best interest to move to two. If you constantly move to two, it's in your interest to move to one. But how to do it will will change the rate of reward that you will see. Yes? So, yes, yeah, so I'm not understanding the correspondence with this data. Right, because on the day, the furthest on the upper right, on the day that reinforcements in key one were 100%, the animal has chosen to choose key one 100% of the time. Right, topic. so this is a trivial result. If you always choose alternative one, you'd all, all your rewards would come from alternative one. So N2 would be equal to zero, and I2 would be equal to zero. So this point is a trivial point. If you always choose one alternative, all your rewards come from that alternative. So I1. I2 will be equal to zero, so I1 divided by I1 plus I2 will be just equal to I1 divided by I1, which is equal to one. So this is a trivial point. Uh, points, other points are less trivial. Um, you also see it in, uh, this is, uh, this is an, a, a different experiment from the lab of uh, Bill Newsom, uh, done by uh, Greg Corrado and Liu Sugu. And, um, 
in, in this case, it was the choices were discrete, so it's not even time for choices. And uh, what they observed is a similar behavior. In this case, the world with water, and choices were made by saccades, and they observed a similar behavior. This is uh, data that was collected by in, in the lab of uh, Randy Gallistel. Um, and uh, here, animal was pressing one of two livers. And, um, the reward was a pleasurable brain st stimulation. And get a similar behavior. Different colors are different parameters of the reward function. Um, similar behavior. Um, this is a fun result. This is an analysis that we did some years ago. Um, so each point here is a basketball player, an NBA basketball player. And what we did was to measure the number of two points and three points attempts in the game. So the N3 would be the number of, sorry, throughout the season. N3 would be the number of three points attempts throughout, throughout the season. N2 would be uh, uh, the number of two point attempts in the season. Okay. And this is the number of points associated with all the three point attempts. And this is the number of points associated with uh, the two point attempts. And you see that the different players align approximately along the diagonal. They behave according to the metric. Yeah. Each one's a player or a team? Each one is a player. What is this parameter that's here? Because it looks like each of the color is a, just a direction that is steeper than the diagonal. So the, the, what they used was uh, the world schedule uh, is called concurrent variable interval schedule. For each of them. So it's concurrent variable interval, variable interval schedule. And uh, these are the parameters of the variable interval schedule. And it will take me like a few minutes to explain the details. So I dread the. Uh, so these are different animals. What you see is different animals and uh, uh, the same parameters. Um, okay, so this is a matching law. It's a. Uh, Interesting law of behavior. It's not uh, gravity without deviations, but still um, somewhat consistent. So we can so tell us the fraction of choices is approximately equal to the fraction of incomes. Or rewriting this equation tells us that the ratio of income to choices is approximately equal for the two alternatives. Or in plain language, it tells us that the return associated with the two options is approximately what is interesting about it is uh, that this uh, matching behavior is uh, is not optimal it's not optimal in the sense that you can do better in general you can do better and nevertheless it's still uh, uh, very common very commonly observed um, and the question is uh, why why do we observe it in all these just conditions despite the fact that it's not the optimal it's not the behavior that uh, uh, maximizes the, the, the rate of reward or anything like that no. yeah and that doesn't that depend on the exact details of the reward schedule but very little baiting that I think actually is that So if you have a viable, you can't viable interval baiting and the optimal um, um, probabilistic policy will give you matching, not, not the optimal policy. Um, but now we can argue that. I mean, we can start an argument, justifiable argument about the question whether, sorry, whether uh, indeed you gain that much from from the opt I mean, moving from the optimal stochastic to deterministic uh, policy. And uh, it's an interesting question. 
the, the point that I would like to make is that funds you see matching also in other conditions where the difference between uh, matching and maximizing large. Now it turns out. Just simply one more quick thing. Here you present this as a the approximate law that you want to understand, but I thought there was also data that shows different laws, like n is proportional to some power of i rather than i. So which of these should we want to explain? Or that's a that's a, a, a wonderful question that I don't want to. Answer and I'll tell you why because it's, it's you, you are addressing a, a real problem and perhaps but it's, it's an, an important uh, question. So let's say that we have two options and uh, the matching law tells us that the ratio of n one to n two the number of choices option one to choices of option two is equal to i one divided by i two. So this is this is called matching. So, but in a different class of uh, uh, experiments, people have reported things like n1 over n2 is equal to i1 over i2 square root. This is called also matching. Since I mean, both of them appear in the literature as matching and it's caused some confusing. But we call this operant matching. This is, in fact, what some people refer to as probability matching. And in the literature, you would also find things like n1 divided by n2 is equal to i1 divided by i2. And this is called generalized matching. Okay, so the question is uh, which one do we want to explain if we have a theory? In different experiments, we get different behaviors, and we shouldn't expect a theory to help us with that. Unless we know what are the parameters that underline a transition from this to this. Now, um, Randy Gallistel has a story, and uh, he told me the story, and also the experience in his book, that while he was teaching it, uh, I think in Yale, he was doing the following experiment. So he was putting animals in a in a tea maze. And uh, there was some probability for this uh, P1 obtaining reward here. Let's say this is two thirds. There's some probability P2 that's in the reward on this side. And every time that people say that, you know, take it back. And, and while he was doing it, uh, he had uh, psychology undergraduate students and that, uh, um, who's, uh, um, that had to predict whether they, they didn't know what's going on here. They received the binary sequence of successes and failures of the animal, success in the sense that it was rewarded or not rewarded. And um, while uh, um, so the animal learns to choose here, and the graduates, the undergraduate students learn to uh, predict what will happen. And it turned out that the animal of these, the behavior of the animals was consistent. This way. And the behavior of the graduates, of the undergraduate students was consistent with this rule. This one is, they were right, they were rewarded more times 
and uh, uh, rewarded, more, rewarded more times than than the undergraduate students. And where one one interpretation is that you know Yale students are worse than uh, Red, but I think his interpretation his interpretation was that the difference between the Yale students and the Reds was that the Reds didn't know what would have happened if the other alternative would have been chosen, whereas uh, uh, the Yale students knew it. And this is how he accounted for the difference in behavior. I don't know if this is a, how, general is, how general this statement is, but I'm going to uh, explain in, I'm trying to explain this behavior, which is widespread, but not general, but, but as I said, there are deviations. Okay. Um, so how are we going, can we explain this behavior uh, as a res resulting from some normative uh, considerations? Now it turns out that if uh, there's no information about the state of the world, if the animal has no information about the state of the world, or doesn't take into account any information about the state of the world. And if the discounting, discounting of future rewards is infinite, that is, animal only cares about the immediate reward, then the only uh, uh, self-consistent time invariant solution would be probabilistic matching. So matching can be explained in this framework as uh, uh, the, own, or the only self-consistent solution, despite the fact that it's not always optimal. That's a way of taking this approach and, and, and use it to explain, um, to, to, uh, to try to explain me. Yes. So in that the animal is effectively integrating over when you say no information about the state of the world, you know observation about current state, but no, it doesn't know what it doesn't know what knowledge of the dynamics. It doesn't have knowledge. We're not talking about learning here. So this is after right. learning. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. So um, uh, we don't have. Uh, we're, I'm not talking about learning. It doesn't know what's the state of the world with respect to the probabilities of rewards in the two sides. Yeah. But does know there is a state and what the probabilities of reward associated with states are, it just doesn't know which state it's in right now. Perhaps a more precise way to, to say it would be that if you behave, uh, uh, if you if your actions are taken uh, using a, 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 a coin. Uh, using the coin that generates matching behavior, then you don't have an incentive to deviate from it. But I, I guess I'm still just trying to understand what belief about the structure of the world that applies to. So if I have a complicated dynamical process where rewards would only come occasionally, I didn't know which state I was in. Then, I mean, is this, are we thinking about a situation where there are a limited number of choices and there's some state, there's some statement about what the dynamics of state might be, the you know, finite set of states, and in each one of these actions have different values, and I have some transition matrix that I don't that I know, but I don't know which state I'm in. Is that no, so all I have is a, a, an observation, it's always a non-observable mark of decision process, so that's like the extreme case of partial observability. Yeah. And I'm reacting to it with a coin. Now there's a, there exists a coin such that given this coin, I don't I, I don't have an incentive to deviate from what the coin tells me to do. But that statement is true. And this would give you matching for in any reward schedule. In any reward. Okay. Any for any reward schedule. Any markup. Because you're saying it's a markup, just the underlying process must be markup. So, like variable interval data can be infinitely, can be in, uh, in, can be uh, uh, infinite state markup. How much time do I have? 
uh, well, the, the, we should uh, finish in 15 minutes. Including break? No. No, no, no. Okay, so um, questions. Okay. Um, so for me, uh, these two one one important uh, outcome of this analysis that I would like to emphasize is that this framework provides a, a normative explanation to to stochasticity in reward, and it can be generalized. Um, to a normative framework to explain stochasticity in neural activity that does not, uh, that has nothing to do with exploration. So even if everything is known about the parameters of the world, there's nothing more new to learn. Still, in some cases, um, the, the only self consistent uh, policies are. Uh, stochastic, and often these uh, uh, policies are not uh, not optimal in the regular, in the normal sense. In the same way that in game theory, we often find that Nash equilibria are not what we would have naively thought as optimal behavior thinking. You know, if you think about uh, uh, prisoner dilemma or, or games like that. Uh, since I have uh, some more time, I would like to uh, uh, discuss another uh, interesting experimental result that I've been involved in. And these are experiments that uh, uh, were done in, in the lab of uh, at Mainen uh, uh, by Masa Murakami some years ago. And um, in, in, in these experiments, uh, the animal is trained uh, uh, to poke, and um, then it has to wait for a, a, for tone one that uh, appears almost immediately, and then there's another waiting time for tone two, and the, the duration, the, the interval between tone one and tone two is a, a drawn from some distribution, from an exponential distribution. I would, I would say a few words about it in a second, but the point is that if it pokes out, then it will receive a small reward if it doesn't wait for the second tone, but if it will wait for the second tone, it will uh, receive a larger reward. So the animal can choose between small reward and large reward. If it waits, it will receive a large reward. If it leaves, it will uh, receive a small reward. Question about experimental design? Uh, yeah, so basically, the question that the animal should, should ask is, is, is in, I'm going back to the first uh, 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 story, whether it should, should I stay or should I go, uh, uh, the red version of it. Now, the distribution of delays is exponential between the first tone and the second tone. And the implications of a, a, an exponential distribution is that uh, the fact that you waited doesn't change the, the, the time that you will have to wait in the second term. So if you waited for, it's like, uh, I don't know, waiting in a bus station from hell, the fact that you've already waited for the bus for half an hour doesn't mean that it's going to come now. So the distribution of the delays between the buses is a exponential. Um, now, what do we expect? What kind of behavior do we expect here? One, one uh, simple thing is that if the interval between the first tone and the second tone is very, very long, then animals should, uh, uh, should go for the, uh, the first tone. If the interval is very short, then clearly they should go, they should prefer the second tone. Now, what would we expect if, what should we expect if the distribution is exponential? 
From the point of view of the animal, assuming that the animal knows everything that there is to know about this problem, so what do we expect? I'd like to argue that we expect uh, uh, deterministic behavior from these animals. So if the uh, uh, distribution is such that you expect to wait a short period of time, then you should wait. The fact that you've already waited that doesn't have any bearing on the time that you need to continue to wait. So you expect that the animal would, um, uh, would wait. We'll wait until the second term. However, if uh, the animal ex uh, expects to wait for a long period of time, the uh, exponential the, the, the function is, uh, has, a, has a large mean, then it should leave immediately, no point waiting. Now, what, uh, what it turns out that this is not the, the behavior that animals that you observe in these experiments. Yeah. And uh, what you find is that. In some trials, the animal is patient. And in some trials, the animal is not patient. So it waits for some time and then gives up. And uh, 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 goes, for, goes for, the, for the smaller level. Now, I will not go into the details of the analysis, but it turns out that uh, the distribution of the time that the animal waits is well approximated by an exponential function, taking into account the fact that the data is sensor, we don't know how much time it would have, it would have waited if the second tone would not have arrived. So it seems that uh, the behavior of the animal at every point in time is the animal tosses a coin, the same coin and decides whether to stay or leave depending on the outcome of this coin. So the, uh, rather than being uh, deterministic, the animal employs a, a, a stochastic uh, policy that is time invariant. So why should we prefer this explanation to us? So to the explanation that, that the animal is inferring that, that exponential distribution is doing that in a way which we know people do with kind of doing a fluctuating way, don't do optimally. So the fluctuation, maybe the policy is deterministic, but the belief is fluctuating. So the actions will be, will be suppressed. But first, I, I have not explained anything, right? I just, I just described the experimental results. Just said that. When you look at the behavior of, when analyzing the behavior of the animals, you find that they behave as if they toss a coin in the sense that the distribution of their waiting time is exponential. Now, now we want to ask ourselves why. Um, now, I'd like to argue that the, the, this, this framework can account for, because if discounting is non-exponential, if it's hyperbolic, then for, for a range of parameters, this is the only self-consistent solution. The policy is but the policy is stochastic, but it's stochastic. It's, I mean, if discounting would have been exponential, or if you had fluctuations in your belief, then in some trials you would have waited forever, and in some trials you would have immediately chosen the alternative, if you, if you infer what would be the uh, uh, distribution. But this, it's, but this is not what you observe. What you observe is an animal tossing a coin. I'd like to argue that this framework can explain it, framework that we discussed in, in the first uh, half of my talk, is it uh, consistent with, uh, with this behavior? We can think about a game of multiple rates or the red decisions whether to stay or leave. Um, you can think about it as a game between multiple selves of, of, uh, of reds. Um, there's another uh, interesting uh, uh, observation, which is uh, it turns out that the rate is not, again, I will not go into the 
because of time, I'll not go into the detail. It turns out that the underlying rate of living is not uh, is not constant. It depends on on the past history of a, a, of the animal, and um, one way of of uh, uh, one way of of uh, thinking about it or modeling it is is to say that there is the animal decides what's the living rate. And then from this distribution of, given this leaving rate, chooses a waiting time from an exponential distribution that is characterized by this. So this seems like a model that fits the data uh, well. And um, if you look at the neural activity, it seems that uh, neurons in the medial prefrontal cortex, they, their activity seems to be encoding the rate of living, whereas neurons in a, a secondary motor cortex really uh, seem to be co coding the actual time that the animal chooses. Yes? Can you switch the um, hyperbolic discounting function for a misunderstanding of the experimental setting so that if the, if the animals haven't learned that there is essentially this exponential waiting time condition um, on, the, on the right reward, I think that is some other way. We get the same thing? In, in a, this, 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 is a, this, is a, this is a question that is difficult to answer, and I'll tell you why. Here I can find, a, I mean, you can think that every trial, the animal believes that a, a reward will, so that it will be rewarded with some probability if it waits until a particular point in time, and once it's Point in time has changed, then uh, no point waiting any longer because it never, will never be rewarded. This is a this is a, a um, yes, this, is a, this is a theory that is consistent with the data, but it's not an interesting one. What what you really mean are what are the alternative? I mean, are there alternative interesting theories that uh, are also consistent with this data? And I don't have a good answer to that. I will skip this. So, I'd like to summarize uh, what we had so, what what discussed. So, we talked about uh, intra in, intertemporal conflicts. Um, we talked about uh, addressing these conflicts um, by looking for a self consistent solution, and that this self consistent solution is often uh, self defeating. It's not optimal in in a naive sense, but it's a uh, um, but still, sometimes this is the only self-consistent solution and can give rise to behaviors in the model that can be interpreted as procrastination, uh, uh, compulsivity, stochastic choice. All these things are things that naturally emerge in this uh, framework. Uh, we had this uh, simple uh, uh, model and we showed that these different behaviors emerge depending on two things, one aspect has to do with the shape of the temporal discounting function. The other one was the polarity of the reinforcers, whether we're talking about pain or uh, pleasure. These were conflicts with the future. Uh, we also talked about uh, conflict with the past. And uh, we related it to a, a operant matching. And we also discussed fashion, which is, I guess is equally important. And uh, finally, I, I showed you some results of choices that rats made that are uh, consistent with uh, with this uh, with this framework in the sense that the stochasticity in their choices is something that naturally emerges. This uh, framework. Um, some of this work were done uh, in collaboration with uh, Drajan Prelek and uh, Sebastian Sung. Actually, this paper on procrastination is a paper that have been procrastinating for a very long time <laughs> and haven't uh, uh, submitted it yet. And, uh, I think it's fun. Uh, the, the analysis uh, of, of the matching behavior was for a graduate student in my lab, uh, Hal uh, Nyman. 
the work on rats was done. The experiments were done by Massa in Zach Mainen's lab. The analysis was done with a student in my lab, Hanan. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's my lab. And this is a, our new neuroscience building. I'd like to thank our funders and thank you for listening. Uh, so this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Thank you for um, for, for the lecture. So I have a um, uh, it's somewhat maybe uh, uh, it's not too general, but how do you think about what do you think about um, delay gratification under this uh, current framework? Uh, and I'm talking about the uh, Michelle. Uh, talk more about delay gratification. So, so delayed gratification, for those of you who haven't heard it, it's an extremely well-known phenomenon where uh, it's, it started with children. Children are, uh, this is from Walter Michel, uh, so children are given... Uh, shall, I, shall I show the marshmallow? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, While you... So how many of you have, uh, do you, how many of you know about delayed gratification? I think all of you know. Okay, great. Then I probably... Don't do it. No, it's fun to show it anyway. Oh, but it's, not. Fun, but anyway, it's fun. It's always fun. <laughs> a little bit. There, there is a little bit. But but one thing that I want to ask is, you know, there's a little bit of fun, but there's also there's a lot of findings, uh, which some of them have been found, but not all of them, that shows that this little this, this delay gratification is you know, five minutes. Has can predict uh, longitudinally success in uh, in life and, and and school and so on. And what something that's so my question is, if life and it has always been taught the reason why that little snippet of uh, is predictive is that the cell is uh, those of self who are managed to say yes, I'm going to wait. 10 minutes to get two cookies rather than eating the cookie right now is because they would always do that in every single, in, in, in little, little moments of lives, right? So, so one immediate question I have then, why aren't they stochastic? Uh, why aren't they keep changing? Because you could think of life as an accumulation of decisions and, I mean, intertemporal conflicts, like little, little snippets of intertemporal conflict. Uh, so, so that's sort of my question. I, mean, I really would love to know what you think about delay gratification. Why is it so predictive? Under the assumption that you know, like that it's predictive. So, first, uh, I think that this assumption that it is, uh, and these results have been contested. Yeah, uh, I'm not an expert, so I don't have an opinion. Uh, but, but the, the question of uh, um, this has this has nothing to do with the shape. It may not have something to do with the shape of the temporal discounting function, how steep it is. So you can get, you could have the same thing with the exponential temporal discounting function. Yeah. I mean, one, one economists uh, uh, believe that people are optimal and you know, do things for their own good, ask themselves, so why, why are people addicted? Why do heroin addicts, why do they do these things to themselves, which are clearly unhealthy? And uh, so one, one, so economists give two classes of explanation. One would be, they don't know what are the consequences, but there's another explanation which they don't care about the consequences because the temporal discounting function is very steep. So they only care about the moment and at the moment, it's always nice to, <laughs> might be nice to, uh, <laughs> So, so in this you will get, if, uh, I mean, the shape of the temporal discounting function is not the crucial thing here, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of the, the shape of the discounting function is, is important for those cases where you want to do something, but you, you eventually don't do it. So this is what, I mean, you want to go, people want to diet, but they don't, they want to exercise, they don't, they want to quit smoking, but they don't. So if you want, why don't you do it? 
but isn't that but isn't that also can't you think about the gratification i wanted to eat it well but i don't i will wait to get a much well, larger reward if you're discounting is steep then the optimal, the optimal thing would be now if your discounting is shallow, then the optimal thing would be to wait for two mushrooms. I'm not sure it takes too much time. Okay. More questions? Any questions from Beijing? Yeah. Uh, or side? No. Oh, there's a question no. over there as well. Yeah, we no. are probably a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's take two more questions and then we'll take the break. Let's have two quick questions. Yeah. If you were not trying to explain the behavior of maps or people, but were instead trying to give advice to people who wanted to design intelligent agents for the future. Do you think there would be a reason to play around with non exponential discount functions? Or is this really focused on explaining the behavior of suboptimal agents that really exist? So, if you want to design an agent that will do something, then is you, as a designer, to determine the temporal discounting function depending on what you see is optimal. So if you want, uh, in that sense, it's not uh, the question is, is, I think yeah, I the details would be uh, depend on what you want the, the agent to do. What I can say is related to the um, um, second half of my talk. If you build an agent uh, that lives in a partly observable world, and uh, you want to control it by combination of finite automaton plus observation from the world and taking into account um, probabilistic uh, stochastic policies is something that should be done even after learning. Yeah. Um, for the rat experiment, I was wondering um, whether you considered looking at their average reward rates the history of their reward and what and whether their decision to or go um, related to it in, in, in any way. So the the history uh, has small effect on on the rate of living, and this allowed us to uh, uh, to do this dissociation between coding of the overall rate and the actual time. Right, and which direction did it go? So when if they had a history of they had a high average reward, you know, average reward rate, they they left and they chose the short term. Oh good. No. Okay, like prediction. I know you showed a slide that related to it, but this one. I, this is something I remember that this something we discussed a lot because I mean, you can come up with predictions in both directions and how the eventual experimental results, but I can look it up during the break. Okay, so thank you again.